His extensive career, Andy has reported for more than 50 countries around the world, covering events such as the Vietnam War and the Soviet-led invasion of Czechoslovakia. As longtime chief of Cox Newspapers Washington Bureau, he managed a staff of correspondents based in several overseas bureaus, which is to say, Andy is very familiar with the experience of being a reporter abroad. For many years, he was a board member of the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, the world's leading organization, helping journalists who have been subjected to attacks, arrests, or harassment by repressive regimes. This last involvement touches on Andy's topic today, growing threats to journalism. Welcome, Andy, and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Madeline. Can you all hear me? Chief Technology Officer did a great job. So, well, um, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, you know, um, normally when I give these talks, I am actually a fairly one dimensional person, which is to say, I am focused on journalism 24 hours a day. <laughs> I have very little other interests. So if I if I go start to ramble on, uh, somebody needs to give me the hook here, but we will try to bring, bring in enough, uh, uh, allow enough time that you can ask a lot of questions if you have any. Um, so the topic today is the threat to journalists uh, worldwide. And um, I need to sort of uh, give you a caveat for those of you who may have seen this talk that I gave at the library, which is way back in January. I began by alerting you that I am not an expert in this area. I know, I know a fair amount about it. Uh, I am not a swashbuckling journalist. I'm not one of those people that's just back from Ukraine or Iraq or something like that. Um, but I do know a lot about this topic uh, because as Madeline said, I I was, uh, I was did a lot of this reporting in a younger life. Um, I, As a kid, I was in Vietnam as a correspondent. Uh, I've covered, this will show my age, I've covered Iraq fighting Iran. This is before we fought Iraq. Uh, and I've covered conflicts in places like uh, Angola, uh, places like that. Um, but I'm certainly not a war correspondent. Those people who do that, uh, that is a special skill. Those are, are weird, driven, brave people who really know the business. And uh, uh, so I just wanted to disabuse you of that. But I also ran, uh, as Madeline said, I ran a, a a foreign bureau as part of my duties as the Washington Bureau Chief of Cox Newspapers, so seven foreign bureaus. So almost on a weekly basis, uh, I was dealing with situations on logistics and whether to send reporters into harm's way. So that gets you into a lot of security uh, issues. And then I was on the board of the Committee to Protect Journalists. For those of you who don't know that, that was started, I think, about 1981 by Walter Kite and others. And it, the basic idea was we need to bring our pressure as the leaders in the world and press freedom on authoritarian regimes to allow independent reporting in their countries. Uh, that has shifted a lot. It's gotten worse. It's, uh, come home, which we will get to in a second. And then um, uh, also uh, a couple of years ago, I got hired by NPR uh, as a consultant. They had lost two correspondents in Afghanistan who were ambushed and killed. And NPR hired me and another uh, a First Amendment attorney to look at all the security protocols of NPR to see if anything was violated that contributed to the deaths of their correspondents. Turned out not to be the case. But interestingly, they asked us then to go further and talk to the world's leading news organizations about their security protocols to make sure that NPR was at the highest standards. So all of this, by way of background, uh, I'm, I'm, of course, that's covering wars, but I knew, I know a fair amount about it. And I know an awful lot just because I'm uh, uh, in my 70s now, I know a lot about how things have changed here. So let me take you back more than 30 years as sort of a benchmark. Uh, I'm a young reporter in the Cox Washington Bureau. This is when newspapers had tons of money. Almost anything I wanted to do overseas, my bureau chief would think and say, yeah, go ahead, do that. 
So uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was I heard about the in a place called Eastern Sahara Desert. Those of you who are experts in this area know this was called the Spanish Sahara. So if you look at a map, you're looking at Africa. Um, the Western Sahara, you've got sort of Morocco in Northern Africa and then Algeria, Tunisia up here. And then there's this thing sort of below them called the Western Sahara Desert. It used to be called the Spanish Sahara. The Spanish left in the mid seventies, basically said this kind of area, there's not much here. And so the Moroccans walked in and said, no, that's ours. It went across the border and said, we're gonna claim it. We had it 1100 years ago. But the people who lived there, known as the Palisario, uh, said, no, it's not that great of a place, but it's ours, you know, and so we want it. So a war started, all right? And I heard about this war and I got intrigued by it because uh, at that time, this is more than 30 years ago, the United States was giving to Morocco uh, more than $100 million in military aid. And this was uh, at a time when we were giving like roughly $100 million to El Salvador and everyone had their, you know, they were focused on that. But here's this war going on in the Western Sahara and nobody knew anything about it. So I decided, you know, went to the bureau chief, said, hey, will you pony up for the money? He said, yeah, sure. I don't know where it is, but it sounds like an interesting story. So uh, I made a contact with the policy representative of the UN that led me to go to Paris, where I met another contact with the policy. They said, go to Algiers. So I went to Algiers, met another contact. Then they flew me down to the southern tip of Algeria where they had their provisional headquarters of this guerrilla movement. And we, after a couple of days, loaded into this Land Rover with myself and uh, my interpreter, Bashir. And there was a, a gunman, a guide, driver, a couple others. And we go into the desert. And the idea is um, I'm going to witness them attacking a Moroccan outpost. But before they did that, the following morning, they said, we need to go collect all the weapons we're going to use and we don't want you to see it and we don't want you to know where it is which let's let's be honest i didn't know where i was anyhow i just know i was in the middle of the desert but they didn't want me to see what else they had so point of this story is they take me to this oasis this is about the size of this all right it's just some scrub brush it's like bloody hot it's 120 degrees in the desert in the daytime they give me a big couple liter bottle of water and said, we'll be back in six or eight hours. All right. Okay. Now the point of this story is that if they had decided not to come back, you would have never found me. I never for one second thought they would not be back. And they were, they did come back. And the reason was in that era, they wanted the publicity. I knew they wanted the publicity. They had an interest in not only showing me what they're doing, but nobody knew about this war. And so they had a deep interest in keeping me alive to tell the story. And it turned out to be a pretty good story. If you were doing that today, uh, first of all, I would never do that um, for several reasons. One is newspapers don't have the money to do this. I mean, when you're committing a reporter and a lot of money for a month or two to, to do these types of things, that doesn't happen that much anymore. But there are several other reasons. One is the world has changed for journalists, and that is that these groups, these non-state players, uh, like the Palisario, which, by the way, that war still goes on, they they talk to each other, and the there is a high likelihood in a situation like that that they might talk to the Houthis in Yemen or the ISIS in Syria, whatever, and that one of those groups will send them. We'll give you three dollars for this reporter hand him over and then what they would do then is use that reporter as leverage to try and get ransom which people say they don't pay but people end up paying it because it's a difficult decision so that's the first change the second change is that you might be thinking uh mr technology here might think about it that probably know that in the modern era reporters that go over and cover this stuff they go with tracking devices on them these things are so precise that if I was at that o oasis today and you were back in the home office, you would know if I got up and walked 20 feet that way. They are that precise. Okay, so that's great. You know where your correspondent is if they don't come back after six or eight hours. How you'd ever find them, I don't know. But anyhow, the, the point is that people track people with the tracking devices. And so the best technology that helps reporters 
in fact, is often increasingly used against them. There have been cases where reporters are identified. There was a famous case in Syria, uh, one of the great war correspondents, Marie Colvin, who you may recall this woman, she had an eye patch, she was just a, a legend. Um, she was identified. And we know from intelligence that became clear several years after that, that there had been dialogue. Where is it? Okay, we tracked her and then they targeted her with a rocket attack and she was killed. So these, it's a changing world um, in, in many ways. But let me tell you the biggest change that has occurred. We have talked about Normandy and those brave correspondents with soldiers that went in and did that kind of work. That was sort of the life of foreign reporting for many, many years. Even through the Cold War, it was your your concern as a journalist was your personal safety, all right? Uh, that has changed. And one of the biggest things I need to leave with you today about how it's changed is that it is uh, no longer about war correspondents covering and the dangers they faced to report for societies like ours. The New threats to journalists are by people reporting on their own country. Um, governments increasingly are targeting journalists, and uh, they are trying to suppress independent reporting. So you look at a place like Russia, there are, there are dozens of unsolved murders, of course, and this is a sharp increase uh, going on around the world. If you look at statistics from the Committee to Protect Journalists, go back 30 years, there they've documented roughly 2,400 journalists that have been murdered. Okay, now you're thinking that's that's a high number. Let's face it, in the context of today's world, where uh, tens of thousands of innocent people are being die uh, killed in Gaza, for instance, not that big over 30 years. I mean, tragic in in every case. But there, in recent years, has been a spike. And the spike is accompanied by the fact that in almost all cases, when there is a murder of a, uh, an independent reporter in some authoritarian regime, they are murdered with impunity. The Committee to Protect Journalists has documented that in 80% of the cases uh, in the last 10 years alone, no charges were brought against anyone. All right. So that's. That is a growing threat. And then add to that the um, step it down for murder, the sharp increase in reporters that just disappear. This happens in many, many societies now. Reporters just went to work one day and then they're no longer there. Uh, you, you don't know what happened to them, but uh, I doubt that they fell in a hole. I mean, I, I think the, the odds are that the government just made them disappear. We know that there are societies where the disappeared has become a major issue. There is also the a sharp increase in reporters trying to operate in authoritarian regimes where their lives are just destroyed. Um, the government brings bogus tax cases against them. Suddenly your kids can't get into school. Suddenly you, you lose your house. You, you know, the bank comes in and takes it over. That is another uh, clever way for government to not just throw you in jail or kill you, but just destroy you. So after a while, you have an increase in independent reporters just say, you know, I can't do it. I can't risk my family. And then there is another group, and this doesn't have to do with uh, government so much, but it is non-state -state players that are killing journalists. This is a big issue in Mexico. Cartels are killing journalists. I, I was part of a delegation, that, this goes back 10 years ago, but we, or more, but we were in Mexico City talking about the importance of the government cracking down on these cartel murders. And there was a journalist from the northern part of Mexico who talked about uh, why he no longer covers the cartels. And of course, to us in America, we thought, well, hey, that's a story. How could you avoid it? And he told this story about how uh, they had been reporting on the cartels. And one of their uh, sources was a police source. And uh, the severed head of, of that policeman showed up on the doorstep of one of the editors of the paper, basically with the note saying, you're next. So what do you do? So you have, you're facing that also. Okay, so what I've 
shifted here is from my personal safety out in this oasis to now this shift what's happening uh, with governments and non-state players. But here's the big gift. Used to be that journalists working overseas cared about their own personal safety. Because of the digital age, you now have to pay particular attention to uh, your sources of information there. Uh, and that is because governments uh, now track everything you say they, do, they go to extraordinary lengths to infect your cell phones, your computers, and all that. So it is not uncommon now for journalists to say, I want to go report from Turkey, which, by the way, uh, till a couple of years ago, was the world's leading jail of journalists, all right? A lot of if you've ever been to Turkey. It's magnificent, wonderful. Istanbul, one of the great cities. It sort of masks this authoritarian thing going on there. Um, in situations like that, these governments will let you go, but they will surveil you in whatever way they can, and then they'll go after your sources. So you're, from a journalistic standpoint, you have to shift your focus to your personal protection to now the sources of your information. You have to go to extraordinary lengths to protect them. And journalists do. I mean, we use Signal, which is a, an encryption device. We all use all sorts of encryption devices, but governments use technology that will de-encrypt, the biggest one being Pegasus, which some of you may have written, read about. Governments are taking this, and they will do anything they can to get inside your electronic devices. This came home to me, this is like in 2015. Uh, there were two years back when we had relations with uh, Russia, um, where I was no longer working for an independent news agency, so I could get State Department came around with grants, and they would hire journalists to go talk in countries about independent journalism, which, by the way, is a tough sell in, in Russia, but I was fascinated to do this. So I did two years of lectures across Russia. You'd start in Moscow, Moscow State University, Siberia, whatever. I ended up one of those trips in Vladivostok. So the geography of Russia is that is the furthest eastern city you can get in Russia. It used to be the home port during the Cold War of the Russian Navy. It used to be a closed city. Now it's just a big sort of not all that attractive city, but it's a big city, you know. And as I landed, uh, got into the terminal, uh, there was a Russian who had been hired by the State Department to be sort of my minder, my guide, taking me. And he was there waiting. He was Dima. He was an English speaker, a great guy. And um, just as I was about to meet with him, two security guards came up, very polite, said, we need to uh, scan your luggage. So they took my luggage and they were about to put it through a conveyor belt thing when Dima, my guy, grabbed it, grabbed these two bags. And there was an argument in Russia. So when we got in the car, I said, what was that all about? He said, they're trying to sack everything out of your electronic devices. And when you think about it, it's not uncommon to have your bag scanned as you're getting on a plane, but it's a little bit unusual when you get there. So the point is that this is a huge issue uh, for reporters now, and not all that easy. The lifeblood of what we do in independent journalism is quality information. So when you're going to a place like Vladivostok, and I did this, there were people that made it known to our embassy they want to talk to an independent American journalist about how they do their job. Well, the government wanted to know who those people were, and they're going to go after them. So this is a huge shift. Um, uh, and let me just finally sort of turn it to say that this, these increasing threats against journalists in all forms uh, sadly have come home to roost in the United States. Um, I think there are a lot of reasons for this. Let me preface what I'm going to say by saying that I am completely politically independent. I've always been a registered independent. Uh, you would have a hard time knowing what my political views are, but I have to say uh, the rhetoric of Donald Trump has not made this better. When you identify journalists as a group of as enemies of the people, you will get death threats. Um, the one of the most telling things that I think about this shift is that now major news organizations, when they send reporters out to cover political rallies, they typically give them what's called hostile environment training. That is a term that we used when I ran a foreign staff. You hire these firms to train journalists on how to react, 
how to read crowds if the crowd becomes ugly, where where you need to position yourself, what your communication needs to be. That training is now routine for people at the Times, the Post, and, and networks. Uh, when networks used to ship their equipment, you would see it at airports about to be loaded up, big logo, NBC News. Those are taken off now. And the reason is that because there are increasing incidents of vandal vandalizing equipment. Let's also keep in mind that in January 6th, scrawled on a door in the Capitol was murder the media. While outside, and you've probably seen the video, people were destroying the equipment. Of, it turned out it was the AP uh, video people, but actually destroying it, taking great delight in it. There was a time late last year, just as I was rotating off the board of the Committee to Protect Journalists, that there was a briefing um, uh, by the head of our group to the board about a study they had done on threats to Washington journalists, specifically White House correspondents. And I'll never forget what they found was, she said, there are credible death threats on a daily basis. Now, it's always been true that people uh, have, in my career, people uh, individually attacked, uh, attacked journalists. I, I think a shift I've seen is that people now attack journalism even when that journalism is rewarding some things that are undeniably true. This gets into confirmation, confirmation bias. Uh, it's, it's a really troubling trend and you don't know where it's going to stop. So um, what might happen uh, if, if there's a Trump election? Uh, again, I don't mean to be political, but uh, he and his allies have talked about what they're going to do with political opponents. We're going to jail them. We're going to bring prosecutions. I think it's not hard to assume, take Donald Trump out of the picture, but if people are emboldened and they hate independent media, it's not too much of a stretch to say, we will bring a tax case against somebody. We will file a bogus lawsuit, libel suit against a small publication because we know they can't afford it. We'll run them out of business. They could take a chapter out of the Erdogan playbook or Putin playbook in Russia, which is uh, in Turkey and in Russia. They're very clever at getting their political allies to buy uh, legitimate news organizations and turn them into ideological organs. That happens a lot. So there's a lot stakes. So the the question, just an ending, is you know um, what do we do about all this? So um, I'll just I don't know, <laughs> all right. But I, let me just offer a thought. Um, every year on May Day, May 1, is something called World Press Freedom Day. And on that day, every year, uh, there is a, an international report uh, that's released called the World Press Freedom Index. It's an amazing study done every year, of roughly 180 countries. And it is looking at their standards for press freedom. So you're looking at things like, is there political harassment? Are people jailed? Uh, you know, Are people thrown in jail? Or is there access to public information? The whenever I give this talk, it always surprises audiences. Of those 180 countries, the United States now ranks 45th. We are just below or after Tonga and just ahead of Gambia. All right. 45th. All right. Now, so who's number one? As you might, if you had to, would you guess how you probably get this? It's the Nordic countries. All right. They're always consistently up there. It's either Norway, Denmark, Sweden, or whatever. So a couple of years ago, I was at the Washington Post. They had a big ceremony when this was released, and they had the ambassador from Denmark to the United States who was on a panel, and they they had been ranked number one that year. And the question from the audience is, why, why are you always number one? And she offered some speculation. She said, what is interesting about our countries, as opposed to yours and most of the world, is that mandatory as part of secondary educa education is uh, uh, news literacy or what we call me media literacy. It's not telling you what to read or what to watch. It's giving people the tools, particularly young people, to make an evaluative process to find what is credible information and make their own, own choices. And you know, just an ending, I, I have a lot of sympathy for the public and particularly young people 
we, because I'm looking out here, a number of people my age, we grew up with three TV networks. We had credible news sources and not that many of them. I don't want to go back to that. I, I think it's great that anybody can call themselves a journalist and try to gain, gain an audience and all that. But I will say that for the public, when you are bombarded with all of this and you're trying to figure out what is credible information, forget for a second where I work, the Washington Post. That is a very, people may not believe it, that is a very high standard of, of, uh, of proof that goes into these stories. So they make mistakes all the time, all the time. But there's a real effort. But when you get into all these other things that are media, that's hard for people to understand. And I think that television doesn't help it because when you're watching, let's say, MSNBC and you see Andrea Mitchell come on at noon, Andrea, I know a little bit, she's a very credible, straight person. And then they hand off to people who are on panels who are clearly ideological. There's no distinction of the fact that they are opinion and we've just given you the news. Why wouldn't the public be confused by this? So it's a big issue. So I think going back to the main topic, it does all feed into this increasing threat to journalists and journalism. So that is my talk, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. How'd I do?